This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, with Valentine's Day approaching, mysteries of love lost and love found, sometimes when you least expect it. Around Chicago, she's known as Resurrection Mary, a pale, mysterious young woman who has teased and beguiled the city for more than half a century. Some say she is nothing more than the product of overactive imagination. Others are certain there is much more to this ghostly beauty than meets the eye. 1974, a difficult choice faced a young South Vietnamese Air Force pilot training in the United States. Should he remain in America, his true love and his unborn child, or should he return to his homeland to fight and perhaps die for his country? His decision and his consequences place Soon Van Nguyen at the center of an unsolved mystery. It was a frightful crash that might have taken Colleen Frangioni's life, if not for the two unknown heroes who pulled her from the wreckage. Tonight, thanks to your calls, Colleen can finally say thank you to the two strangers who saved her life. Also, we'll profile one of the most astounding armored car robberies in history. Seven million dollars was stolen, and much of it has gone to finance terrorist activities. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. It's late on a moonless night. You're on a dark, lonely road. The shadows seem to reach for you. The sudden rustle of leaves makes you jump. Your heart beats faster and faster. You assume it's your imagination, unless you're on the road to Resurrection Cemetery, just southwest of Chicago. In January of 1979, a cab driver found himself on that road on just such a night. He was about to have an extraordinary experience, which a number of Chicago cabbies claimed to have had over the years. Say, miss, I'm, I'm lost and can't find my way back to town. Look, if, uh, if you point me out the right direction, I'll, I'll give you a lift wherever you want to go free of charge, OK? Why don't you hop in? Just over a mile ahead was Resurrection Cemetery, one of the largest in the Midwest, the final resting place of more than 150,000 souls. Stop here. Stop here. The cabbie parked across from the cemetery's front what gate. Stop here for? The mysterious passenger had vanished without so much as a door slam. The unwitting cab driver had just met Chicago's most famous ghost, Resurrection Mary. I think that of all the ghost stories worth believing in, Resurrection Mary is the one with the best documentation. The witnesses that I found are remarkably level-headed, and they're primarily blue-collar, middle-class types who have steady jobs and who uh, have no other major claims to psychic encounters in their life. According to Richard Crow, the earliest account of Resurrection Mary came from a man named Jerry Palis, who died in 1992. In 1986, when he was 72, Jerry described his encounter in a videotaped interview. experience because uh, when I uh, met her at the uh, dance hall, I watched that uh, at the entrance there for quite a while. The year was 1939. On most nights, throngs of young people fill Chicago's dance halls. 
One of the regulars was Jerry Palos, who considered himself something of a ladies' man. Hey, you know that girl over there? I'm gonna ask her to dance. Jerry described the woman as being blonde, about five foot seven. Her hair was about shoulder length, and she had curls along either side of her head. She was wearing an old-fashioned, uh, or I should say a very fancy type uh, uh, party dress of the period, old-fashioned to today's terms. It's Mary, isn't it? That's a pretty name. Jerry danced every number with week. a quiet, captivating young woman. I couldn't help noticing somebody as pretty as you. He learned little about her, except that her name was Mary, and she lived on the south side of town. Where? South Damon. Your hands, they're like ice. Must mean you have a warm heart. Can I give you a ride home? Please. As we walked along to, to the street, uh, she says, well, you might as well take me down to Archer Road. And I said, what for? I said, you live uh, here and here, where, where you told me. And she says, no, she said, I want to go out to Archer Road. Boy, it sure is quiet out here. What'd you want to come out here for? Stop. What? Stop the car. This wasn't at all what Jerry had expected. I need to get out here, please. Mary had asked him to stop in front of Resurrection Cemetery. Just please, just wait right here. Jerry claimed that the young woman vanished right before his eyes. Jerry admitted he was perplexed, but certainly willing to forgive one unexplained disappearance. The very next day, he went out to Damon Avenue, where Mary had said she lived. Jerry found the house with little trouble, but before he could even knock, the front door swung open. Yes, can I help you? Excuse me, I don't mean to disturb you, but I'm looking for a young woman named Mary. I was told she lives here. You must be mistaken. There's no one here by that name. Wait, that's the woman I'm looking for in that picture. No, that's not possible. That girl is my daughter, and she has been dead for five years. I danced with that girl last night. It's then Jerry said that he understood why the woman he was dancing with that night was ice cold to the touch. He had worked in a funeral home for a while, and it was the touch of a corpse. The revelation naturally cooled Jerry's romantic interest in the mysterious beauty. Years later, Richard Crow learned the ghost was believed to be the restless spirit of a young woman named Mary Bregovi. Mary had been killed in a traffic accident one Saturday night in 1934, a month before her 21st birthday. Around Chicago, Folks like to believe Mary had just left the dance hall when she died. She was laid to rest in Resurrection Cemetery, they say, in her favorite gown. Over the years, the bewitching spirit has been seen time and time again, at dance clubs, in taxis, and simply strolling outside the cemetery, looking, as the legend goes, for someone to take her home. I really didn't think there was any ghost. You hear these stories and these old ghost tales, but um, it's never happened to me. But now I um, must say I think I'm changing my mind. In 1980, Claire Rudnicki, her husband Mark, and two friends were driving on Archer Avenue along the front of Resurrection Cemetery. And I was just looking out the window as we were going down the street. And on the right-hand side of the road, there was a girl walking. Look ahead. Look, it's a, it's a girl. She was bright, very bright, like illuminating. 
She was just walking very slow. I remember thinking, oh my God, it's Resurrection Mary. And I can feel my stomach starting to turn. Let's go back. No. I Look. was very frightened. I have to admit, it did scare me. No, I don't want to go, go back. back. I don't go Let's back. go back. No, no, I don't On the other hand, Claire's husband, Mark, was ready to swing around for another look. No one could have pulled a prank like that because she was so bright and illuminated, and there was no light source from which that light could have come. She was just a bright object, a glowing figure on the side of the road. And uh, when we were coming up behind her, I looked at her from behind on the side, and when I had driven past her, and all the time I was looking at her face, and there was like a black void. There was really nothing there. There was no facial features. We all went past it, turned around and came back, and by the time we had gotten back to where we had originally seen her, it had gone, vanished. She was all in white, and uh, her hair and the dress were, were flowing back. It was like a, a stream backwards, you know, away from her and I just saw this profile of a young woman. So what time are you leaving tomorrow? Mm. Around seven. In October of 1989, Janet Kolal and a friend set out for an evening drive. <laughs> uh, After about an hour, they found themselves at Resurrection Cemetery. There was no impact, there was no, no bump to say that, you know, I had hit something. But I know she ran out. Um, the young woman ran out in front of my car, and I hit her. Just calm down. Everything's going to be and OK. And yet, Let's nothing. Just go back to your apartment. No impact, no sound, nothing. OK. My dad had told me the story about Resurrection Mary before because he had read it in the newspaper back in 1939. But I never thought that I would be party to it, uh, that I would see it myself, or that I would be with a friend who would have seen her. You can pick apart individual ghost stories, but when you come up with a story like Resurrection Mary, where we have dozens of reports spanning decades, I think you've got to go a long way to trying to undermine all that massive documentation. I like to drive past the cemetery to see if I can see her again. <laughs> I but. never want to see her again. <laughs> It's so fresh in my mind still. It still scares me. I didn't believe in ghosts until I saw her. And the, the way I know it was really a ghost is you just know. Does the ghost of Mary Bragovi still haunt Chicago late at night? Or is Resurrection Mary simply a time-honored urban myth? In any case, should you find yourself driving in the city late one night and you spot a wistful young woman in a flowing gown, you might think twice about offering her a ride. Tonight we have an update which is one of our most touching and poignant. It concerns a woman searching for two men to complete strangers she never even talked to. But during one fateful encounter in 1978, they saved her life. She has been searching for them ever since, simply to say thank you. Hi, Colleen. Hi. Welcome to our class. Thank you so much for Colleen Frangioni was paralyzed from the waist down more than 15 years ago in a horrible automobile accident. Since then, she has spoken to thousands of high school students, urging them to wear seatbelts. Buckle up, I didn't. It's my slogan. Every time Colleen speaks in a classroom, she relives the night of September 23rd, 1978. of that second car just twisted me beyond the normal range. And that twist was so forceful that it broke two lower vertebrae and severed my spinal cord. And, and, and I'm glad I don't remember it. In the midst of the chaos, two bystanders pulled Colleen from the burning wreckage. 
However, both men disappeared before anyone could get their names. Colleen has never stopped looking for them. When Colleen's appeal aired, luck was with her. Both men called her phone center. Their names are Ray Myers and Mike Kane. Though they both live in the Providence, Rhode Island area, they had seen each other only once in the aftermath of Colleen's accident. Colleen was thrilled to learn that her rescuers had been found after more than 15 years. What Unsolved Mysteries did was the tip lady called me, told me, you know, that she had heard from one of them and gave me his number because, of course, they didn't want to give out my number. So um, I called him, I said who I was, and, and it was just so nice. In fact, we talked so long that night, my husband fell asleep. We were in bed and my husband fell sound asleep while him and I were just talking about, um, you know, he was telling me things that I had no idea. On December 27th, 1993, Colleen finally was able to meet her heroes in person. Ray Myers was the first to arrive. Oh, my God, I can't believe I can really touch you. I really didn't think that you existed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I was in shock. Yes, I do. I couldn't believe it was me, you know. I mean, I knew it was me, but it's like, it's incredible. That's how I feel about this whole thing. I think it's incredible. Half an hour later, it was Mike Kane's turn. Hi. Hi. Mike? Mike. Oh, gosh, how nice to meet you. Thank you so much. You know, I tried to imagine what you look like, and, and I can't do that when I don't know the person. I'm surprised, you know, why 15 years later? Oh, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Why, why, you know, why? It's so important. But when she said she wanted to thank the people, and after I spoke to her on the phone, it was like, this lady is really sincere, you know? And that's what she wanted, she wanted to thank us. It's your name. Right. I feel the whole circle, it's all completed. All the pieces of the puzzle How did I get your number? are all put together now. And, and it's a real peaceful feeling inside. But that's, to me, and, and in fact, how many times have I said in the last two weeks, how many people get to meet their guardian angels? And this is how I feel. Next, a young woman disappears in the wake of a near fatal motorcycle accident. These days, most of us are resigned to keeping in touch with friends and family by telephone. The calls are usually a source of comfort and pleasure. But for one California mother, a phone call from her 28-year-old daughter began a nightmare which is yet to end. As a rule, we do not air stories about grown children who choose to separate from their family and friends. But the case of Selena Eden is special. When she graduated from high school in 1980, Selena was everything a parent could ask for. She was president of the student body and of the senior class. But Selena had always marched to her own drummer. She dropped out of college to join the Air Force. Then after a stint, Selena became a journeyman construction worker in San Francisco. She joined the Teamsters and bought herself a motorcycle. She was humorous. She was also quite daring. She was the kind of child, like, say, it was things that you wanted to do that, you know, in life, this was the child that kind of did it, was that daring. On November 29th, 1989, Selena was on her way home from the Union Hall in downtown San Francisco when tragedy struck. After the accident, she was in a coma for six weeks, and uh, she had some brain damage. She had a long way to go. Selena was admitted to the hospital as a Jane Doe. Her ID papers had disappeared in the aftermath of the accident, and seven days passed before her mother and brother were tracked down in San Diego. Selena, baby, look who's here. Dion, he came with me today. Hi, Dad. Hi, baby. How you feel? 
Okay. They being good to you? She had lost a lot of her memory. Sorry. So it really kind of took away her personality. Mother, don't leave me, okay? Don't leave me. She appeared to be like a child again. Like she didn't know too much anymore. You know, she just, you know, like, like a child. Selena's left eye had been permanently damaged. She suffered painful headaches. Her left thigh was crushed, and a severe head injury caused fluid to build up around her brain. Nevertheless, Selena dove into an exhausting regimen of physical therapy. Selena was the type of patient they had to slow up. She wanted to do everything in a hurry. She wanted to walk before she could walk. It was just that she was, like, rushing everything. She challenged herself to the max, and it was like a lot of things that she just couldn't do. And I guess she just uh, wasn't ready to accept the fact that she wasn't well yet. Come on, okay. Two months after the accident, Selena's brother brought her home to San Diego. Selena planned to live with her mother and niece and continue physical therapy on an outpatient basis. Welcome home, baby. Thank you, Mama. Oh, How you feeling? Okay, Mama. Feel good, baby. You're doing good. You know, when she was living with me, um, she started having more, like, confused episodes. Being the mother, I could see it, and um, medical people, you know, really couldn't see it the way I could. There was a lot of changes. I, I, I feel that sometimes she had her days that she could be quite mean, and then that was the days I would notice that um, she was having a lot of headaches. Uh-huh. So we'll do that. Bye. Soon the headaches gave way to general confusion. Physically, Selena was getting better, but mentally, she was worse. Are you all right, baby? Mama, who was that I was talking to? I don't know who you were talking to. Did you forget? Yes. I forgot. Things like that would upset her. That's when I noticed her frustration more and more, and she felt like more and more she wanted to be on her own, but the more she pushed it, the more confused she was becoming. With her recovery stalled, Selena decided to return to San Francisco in May of 1990. She hoped that the familiar surroundings would help her. Lori. Yeah? Who's that girl? What girl? What is up by the house today? You mean Liz? Yeah, Liz. Who is she? She's your friend, Selena. She's very happy to be in San Francisco she and to be it. around her friends. But, oh. you know, she didn't appear healthy enough to be on her Are you, own. Are you OK? Fine. She was very unaware of a lot of things. I think she definitely needed somebody to be with her, you know, to help her. Despite her erratic behavior, Selena had been in the habit of calling her mother regularly. Finally, in October of 1990, nearly one year after the accident, Clarissa Eden received a phone call she would never forget. Hello? Selena. Mama, I'm going away for a while. I met someone who promised to be kind to me. Who? She was evasive Selena, with me. Don't and that wasn't like her. She know. would tell me everything. You need you to know. come home. Give me I said, Selena, what you need to do, you need to come back home. And she said, well, don't worry if you don't, don't hear from me in a month or two. Selena, you should come back home. And then she said, I'll be calling you soon, and hung up. And that's the last I've heard from Selena. The last time I heard anything of Selena, she was leaving for somewhere in the Midwest, and I can't remember where, with some woman who she had just met. And I got the impression that she probably didn't know much more about the woman than I did. And I didn't even know the person. I had no idea who it was. And uh, I couldn't get a last name from her. Uh, and it was just kind of a haphazard plan. There was no plan. It's like, I'm going. Excuse me. Selena's family hired a private investigator to search for her. Even after she told her mother she was leaving town, Selena was sighted in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. Some people said they saw her around here. When was she here? A few weeks back. 
The investigator followed up on all the leads, but it turned out to be a fruitless search. And if you do see her, mm -hmm. would you give me a call? Yeah, sure. Thanks. You know, I just hope she's out there, probably, you know, just living her life, and for what reason she didn't call us. Maybe it's just because she forgot us. Maybe she just don't remember. You know, hopefully it's one of those stories. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can find her, you know. I want to see my daughter again. That's my baby. I love her like I love all my children, and I want her back with us. I want her to try to call or someone call for her if she's unable to call and let us know where she is and how she is. On New Year's Eve of 1991, a year after Selena had disappeared, she left a garbled message on her friend Lori Gallagher's answering machine. It was the last time any of Selena's friends or family heard her voice. Since then, a lawsuit has been filed in Selena's name regarding the accident. However, the action cannot proceed until Selena is found. Selena Marie Eden is 31 years old and stands 5 feet 6 inches tall. At the time of her disappearance, she weighed 125 pounds. She has a pronounced stiffness in her left leg, which causes her to limp. In a moment, a daring $7 million heist funds a bold act of international terrorism. It's hard to imagine what $7 million in cash would look like. But 1983, one man managed to steal that astounding sum. Single-handedly, he wrestled 50 heavy bags of currency out of a vault, loaded them into a getaway car, and vanished. The daring robbery still stands as one of the greatest heists in United States history. The key figure in the holdup was a brazen 25-year-old armored car guard named Victor Manuel Herrera. At the time of the robbery, Herrera was a trusted employee at the West Hartford, Connecticut office of the Wells Fargo Express Company. What's up, Vic? September 12th, 1983. Irena's arrival at work that day was unremarkable, except for the one special request he made of his supervisor. Excuse me, Jim. I need to ask a big favor. <clears throat> Is there any way I can park my car over here at Bay 5? I would really appreciate it. What's wrong with your car? It's not mine. It's a friend of mine's. I hate to see something happen to it. You know how it is outside. You know, I'm really not supposed to be doing this. I'll let you do it this one time. Just don't take advantage of me, Victor. Thanks. Appreciate it. OK, Vic. All right. <clears throat> the vehicle that Victor was driving that day was a, a 1973 uh, Buick LeSabre, which was a, a full-size big car capable of, of carrying a, a large load, whatever that may be. That day, Herina and his partner made all their scheduled rounds, collecting more than $3 million in currency from local banks and businesses. The Wells Fargo vaults already held more than $4 million. Tim, I'm going to check in the guns. Okay, take the line. Thanks. By 9 p.m., Herina, his partner, and the supervisor were alone in the armored car terminal with more than $7 million in cash. Listen, I'll kill you. I swear Victor. to God, I'll kill you. What are you doing? Shut up! Stand up! Come on! You! Lay down! Victor. Lay down! No! Lay down! Move it! Put your hands behind your back! Victor. Shut up! He handcuffed his supervisor's arms behind his back and also taped up uh, their mouths and used duct tape to tape their feet and, and bind them so they couldn't move. And he put jackets over both their heads so they would not be able to see what was going on. OK, guys, this injection is just going to put you to sleep now. Authorities never determined what the syringe contained, but it did not put the guards to sleep. Herina began to move the $7 million, bag by bag. It took the better part of an hour and a half to load his car with about 1,000 pounds of cash, roughly half a ton in marked and unmarked bills. Hey, 
After the car was loaded, we believe that he sent a signal to someone on the outside that uh, was helping him. He honked the horn and opened the bay door to the terminal. Um, it's believed that at that point, someone else came into the terminal and drove his car out of the terminal with the money inside the car. But the guards uh, at this point, I'm sure, were very upset, and, and even more so when they, when they heard a shotgun uh, being loaded, which is a very distinctive sound. However, Helena left the building without harming the guards. They soon worked themselves free and called the police. 18 hours later, Herena's car was found abandoned about eight miles from the Wells Fargo terminal. Victor Herena had vanished, along with every last cent of the stolen money. Investigators soon discovered that the daring theft was far more than a one-man operation. It had been masterminded by a Puerto Rican terrorist group that counted Victor Herena among its members. The group called themselves Los Macheteros, literally the machete wielders, and they were fighting for nothing less than the independence of Puerto Rico. The island of Puerto Rico was ceded to the United States by Spain in 1898. Eventually, some Puerto Rican groups began to agitate for a complete break with the United States. At times, they turned to violence. In 1950, two Puerto Rican terrorists attempted to assassinate then-President Harry Truman. The failed attack left one White House guard dead and two injured. More than 30 years later, Los Macheteros attempted to strike another blow. Flush with millions from the robbery, the group purchased a surface-to-wear missile, apparently from a black market arms dealer. On October 30, 1983, they launched it at the FBI headquarters in San Juan, Puerto Rico. However, little damage was done, and some of Herena's co-conspirators were quickly arrested. Victor Herena eluded capture, and he was soon elevated to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Victor Manuel Herena is now 35 years old. He has brown hair, striking green eyes, and when last seen weighed around 165 pounds. He stands five feet, six inches tall. Authorities believe Herena has been hiding out in Cuba, but may soon return to the United States. Victor Herena should be considered armed and dangerous. When we return, the poignant story of a father and daughter torn apart by the war in Vietnam. May 1968. Soon Van Nguyen was among hundreds of South Vietnamese officers dispatched to England Air Force Base in Louisiana for jet pilot training. Soon was scheduled to remain in the United States for seven months. He felt lonely and displaced until a local family, the Gautiers, took him under their wing. They had six children. Their oldest son was stationed in Vietnam. Mrs. Gautier was thinking about her son being a foreigner in Vietnam, in the same situation as my friends and I were here in America. Because of that, she helped us on the weekends so that we feel comfortable, just like we were in our own country. One of the Gautier's daughters, Gwendolyn, was the same age as Soon. In no time at all, the two of them had fallen in love. But inevitably, the war intervened. In December of 1968, Soon completed his training. He and Gwendolyn had one final night together before they said goodbye. Why are you crying? I don't want you to go. We can leave this place. We could go to Canada or something. Gwen. Why not? I can't. Why can't you? Because of my honor as an officer in the Air Force, I could not desert my countrymen. And so I said to Gwen, I have to go back. 
But I hope that someday we would see each other again. I gotta go. Wait. Within weeks, Soon was flying combat missions in Vietnam. Soon often received letters from Gwendolyn, but one letter carried news that would change his life forever. Gwen was pregnant with his child. After barely escaping from death on a very dangerous mission, I came back and there was good news. Coming back from a tense mission and hearing the good news, I was so happy at that moment. On August 28, 1969, Gwen Gauthier gave birth to a healthy baby girl and named her Kimberly Karen. Gwen continued to write faithfully. Soon could do nothing except write back. Five long years passed, years in which Soon yearned to see his little girl. He felt frustrated and helpless, caught in the middle of a war more than 9,000 miles away from Kimberley. But fate stepped in. In June of 1974, Soon was sent back to England Air Force Base for further training. Gwen's mother was now divorced and living in a mobile home. Soon went to visit her, not knowing whether Gwen and Kimberly lived there. Not knowing whether after five years, Mrs. Gautier would be friend or foe. I, I don't believe it. S Soon? Hello, Mrs. Gautier. Oh, oh. Oh my God. She kept saying, oh my God, I cannot believe it. From what I could understand, she had never imagined that she would see me again or that Kim would ever see me at all. Just wait till you see her. She is the most beautiful little girl in America. <laughs> Where are they? Houston. Uh, y you did know that Gwendolyn got married. No, when? Oh, about a year ago. Mrs. Gauthier became Soon's closest ally. She contacted Gwen in Houston and arranged a meeting. Hello, Soon. Hello, Gwen. And I looked at her and knew right away that this was my child. Emotions were running high. I really wanted to hug my child. This child I had waited so long to see, but the situation simply did not allow it. It's good to see you. Mrs. Gauthier convinced Gwen to let Kimberly come back to Louisiana for the duration of Soon's assignment. For nearly a month, Kimberly lived with her grandmother and Soon spent every free moment with his daughter. Soon had no idea that Mrs. Gautier had told Kimberly he was her father. What'd you say? Daddy? Why you call me that? Because you are. How do you know that? Because you Kim said, because her hair was black, her eyes were black, and her skin was dark skin. And she was especially proud to point out that she had a flat nose, <laughs> an Asian nose. Finally, the day Soon had dreaded arrived. I thought she'd come with me tomorrow to airport. Gwen came to take Kimberly back to Houston. Soon knew the war was not going well, that he might never be able to return to his daughter. Can she stay one more day? No, she can't. This isn't a fairy tale, Soon. You're going back to Vietnam tomorrow. 
We got to go. The time had been so short, and now we were parting. I didn't know if I would ever see my daughter again. I couldn't control myself. I broke down and cried. And that's the truth. Soon shipped out to South Vietnam in July of 1974. In less than a year, Saigon fell to the communist government of North Vietnam. Along with thousands of other South Vietnamese, Soon was incarcerated in a re-education camp where he languished for nearly 10 years. In 1984, Soon was released from the camp. Two years later, he married and eventually had two children. In 1993, Soon and his family immigrated to the United States, where Soon has continued the search for his daughter. And on our broadcast, he asked if someone in our audience could help reunite them. That night, the switchboard in our phone center lit up with calls from Kimberly's friends and family. Kimberly, who lives in Pineville, Louisiana, was thrilled to learn that Soon was looking for her. Over the years, Kimberly had searched for Soon, but had always run into dead ends. Now she was anxious to be with her father again. A few days later, Soon and his American sponsor traveled to Louisiana for an emotional reunion with Kimberly. It was her first time together in more than 20 years. Hi. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Soon was overcome with emotion. Still, he wanted to convey his feelings in English. When in Vietnam, I never, I never, never think I cannot, uh, I can meet her. But now it's my dream to be true. I'm very, very happy. Sure. <laughs> And then we hugged, and then we said hello, and then it was just, you can't describe the feeling. It was just like, <sighs> nice. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't do the feeling justice, but it was just incredible, fantastic, wonderful, <laughs> great. <laughs> Later that day, Soon celebrated with 20 members of Kimberly's family, including her mother, Gwendolyn. Oh, kind of topping. I said she likes pineapple. To see them together is just a dream come true. I'm telling you. A fairy tale that uh, had had some bad detours, but it came to a happy ending. Oh, this is a big day, a happy day. I, I think I cannot forget it. I knew that wherever he was, that he loved me. And I was always certain in my heart that one day we would be back together. For Soon and Kimberly, the end of their long search marked the beginning of a new life for both of them. Next week, Unsolved Mysteries travels to Lourdes, France, one of the world's most mystical and revered locales. Since 1858, millions of religious pilgrims have visited the Basilica, where the spring waters are said to have the divine power to cure the sick. In this fascinating study, meet two women who believe their illnesses were cured by a miracle at Lourdes. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Join me again next week on Unsolved Mysteries.